I'm Mickey Pellerano, and this is Time Lord TV, the show where we talk about astrology, occultism, and how they interface with art and culture. Today's topic is Hermeticism, a spiritual tradition that originated during the Hellenistic era by the fusion of Egyptian indigenous mysticism with Greek Stoic and Platonic philosophy. Hermetic scholars penned their texts under the epithet Hermes Trismegistus, a mythical figure that combined the Egyptian god Thoth with the Greek god Hermes, both of which were said to rule over magic and wisdom. The Hermetic tradition evolved through late antiquity and into the early Middle Ages in Persia, whence derives its most famous axiom, as above, so below. Stated in the concise text known as the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, this statement contains the core criterion of all magic and mystical traditions, that the individual is an intrinsic microcosm of a macrocosmic universe that is both intelligent and intelligible. Hermetic thinking was highly influential during the Renaissance and Enlightenment eras, primarily through the work of such figures as Marsilio Ficino, Pico della Mirandola, and Giordano Bruno. It also forms the core of what we consider contemporary occultism today including the recent upsurge in popularity in Hellenistic astrology made possible by the translation work of Project Hindsight. We're fortunate to have with us today one of the most celebrated historians of esotericism, Mitch Horowitz, to discuss this topic. Mitch is a prolific lecturer and writer of several books, including the outstanding Occult America and the recent and highly inspiring The Miracle Club, along with its companion manual, The Miracle Habits. Our musical guest today is Rene Nunez Cabrera, who performs under the names Horoscope and Moist96, and he's also a Miami Cuban just like me. So we're going to have a great show today. Please stick around. We're going to start off with the astrological forecast as usual, and then on to the show from there. March 28th, full moon in Libra. The full moon in Libra signals culmination in partnership, harmony, loyalty, sophistication, and symmetry. And this moon applies powerfully to Venus, the ruling planet of Libra, at a significant phase of her cycle. Venus has just experienced her superior conjunction with the sun, immolating her identity as a star of the morning. Here, we see Venus at her highest speed rapidly outpacing the sun to make her debut appearance as an evening star. As chief benefic of the night skies, Venus rejoices in her nocturnal phase and unveils her enticements immodestly. Just like the new moon begins to wax each month after a conjunction with the sun, so too does Venus burst forth after her solar union, marking renewal and transmutation of the experience of love, beauty, pleasure, and the creative act. Venus is still hidden under the beams of the sun, and in Aries her temperament is forceful and undignified. But she has a direct view into the Libra moon over which she rules, calling for a boldness conducted with grace, clean breaks from imbalanced compromises, and new bonds of trust to be forged with the fire of passion. Saturn, the exaltation lord of the Libra moon, looks upon this event from the unexplored rivers of Aquarius, encouraging depth and the embracing of mystery in this new dawn of Venus. Mars, the current ruler over Venus and the Sun, also stands in favorable aspect to all parties involved. He is in his own face of Gemini, where the seemingly paradoxical find cohesion and reconciliation. But his drives are made ravenous by his conjunction with the North Node, casting a compulsory and untrustworthy air to both ardor and aversion. A certain madness is inherent to all passion, but Mars is far too close to the node for us to act on impulse at this time. The North Node bends a planet toward excess and delusion and brings forth distorted results. 
we may find ourselves overtaken by lust or the impulse to enmesh, or craving to integrate shadows that are better left untouched. For the first half of April, it is wise to err toward the elegance of Libra while passively observing our passions as we prepare for the new moon. Mercury in Pisces is better suited to fantasizing than strategizing anyway. Through this process, we may find our preferences evolving in refinement, our allegiances shifting, and our pleasures enveloped in new outer forms. Force and surrender, diastolic, systolic, these are the rhythms of nature with which we must fall in step as a new narrative of desire unfolds. April 11th, New Moon in Aries. The new moon in Aries, fresh and unencumbered of commitment, waxes towards Venus in her most seductive face, just as Mercury conceals himself beneath the rays of the sun. Here, our ambitions can commence to take rapid form whilst maintaining a coy and charismatic exterior. Though Mercury is not debilitated in Aries, it is his time to plunge into the sun's fiery core and re-emerge as a member of the nocturnal sect. The mind journeys outward into the adventurously abstract and probable to gain foresight and elevation of our goals. The secret knowledge lurking under the stirring new martial drives and lunar needs are comprehended as Venus grows in power and visibility. But in order to come to know her, we must wield the sword of Mars and Gemini to slay whatever shadows may have crept in at the new moon. Though by no means in the clear, Mars has separated from the North Node enough to have his wits better about him, and finishes out his tenure in Gemini in the wiser face of a well-positioned Saturn, who should help to exercise discretion toward which passions end up on the cutting room floor. As the moon moves away from the harsh demands of Saturn and toward the infinite possibilities of Jupiter, it is with optimism and wonder that we must approach our Venusian refashioning. April 14th through 19th, Ingress into Taurus. As Venus enters Taurus on the 14th, we can begin to luxuriate in the natural, the sensual, pleasures of the rustic and pastoral, the comforts of camaraderie, the horticultural and the culinary. Venus is ruler in Taurus, and she now encounters the titanic Uranus in her domain. Uranus is a slow-moving planet of revolt, defiance, innovation, and eccentricity. Whatever sign Uranus transits points to the radical spirit of an era. During its transit of Scorpio, we saw the emerging of punk and the AIDS crisis. Through Sagittarius, new wave arose with its romantic idealization of the future. Through the austerities of Capricorn came Grunge with his penchant for work boots and flannel. Through Aquarius, considered by astrologers of the modern school to be the domicile of Uranus, the internet age began. Through Aries, self-branding, self-portraiture, and self-identification were the rage. Whenever Uranus comes into hard aspect with Saturn, we encounter conflict between stubbornly established power structures and the revolutionary zeitgeist. The Sun and Mercury follow close behind Venus into the lush pastures of Taurus with vitality, patience, and planning. And their forces will align with Uranus against the powers of a formidable Saturn. For the next two years, this conflict will unfold in its intricacies. We have already witnessed monumental civil rights movements, an exodus from the metropolitan to the rural, and the emergence of novel currencies. These are certain to soldier on, and optimistically, the transit of Uranus through Taurus may also bring new ecological paradigms and stabilizing currents of health and prosperity. April 26th, full moon in Scorpio. This is an interesting full moon because the moon has her fall in Scorpio and Scorpio's ruler, Mars, has just entered his fall in Cancer. And yet the two bodies are bound by mutual reception because they occupy signs ruled by each other. This is considered a positive arrangement in traditional astrology and will mitigate the ill effects of their lack of dignity. A planet is said to be in its fall when it occupies the zodiac sign opposing its sign of exaltation. 
The moon is exalted in the fertile and fruitful realms of Taurus because she is the generative force of the material world. Scorpio, by contrast, is furtive, destructive, macabre. Mars is exalted in Capricorn because brute force and ambition are cherished in Capricornian labors. But in Cancer, where nurturing, bonding, and sentimentality runneth over, the tempestuous nature of Mars does little good and at worst can bring cowardice or emotional violence. We are reminded of Romeo's verses of the envious moon, whose vest delivery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it, cast it off. All fool moons signal such renunciation, but with a Scorpio moon, such transmutations must run deep. We can invoke dramatic detox, exorcism, necromancy, dazzling makeovers, and resurrections of causes we thought to be entirely lost. Such intentions may raise the eyebrow of Saturn and mitigate his preventative configuration. With the moon reflecting back the solar impulse tinted with the magic of Mercury, the liberating power of Uranus, and the emerald radiance of the Venus who exalts her, we would do well to use this moon to extract any poisons that have hindered our alliance with Venus whose renaissance this month is heralded by the oceans of the evening sky.
so glad you're here. Yeah, thanks for having me. My pleasure. So what's this track we just heard? Uh, so this is kind of like a mix of an improv kind of jam, you know, and uh, this track from an upcoming tape that I'm doing. What is the new tape that's coming out? Uh, I have a few things. I'm kind of purging everything that I've recorded in the past like year, two years. So uh, this one is kind of like a soundtrack to a film I abandoned during quarantine. That's a, uh, you know, I think a lot of my music stuff is kind of just uh, like a soundtrack to movies I can't afford to make or like ideas that it's just easier to just like push out that way so huh i always felt that way too with film it was like okay it's like you're working with these spirits of the elements right be they like metals or chemicals or something and you kind of like send them off to do their own thing and then they return to you in a form that that they choose you right know? yeah for sure especially with like you know with music it's like no one really can say they claim they write music or something because it's like you're kind of just like a you're just a receptor of like these ideas you have being of like whatever you've done or, you know, so like you're just curating these sounds that like are chance happenings, especially with like electronic music, at least for my kind of stuff, it's like a chance happening. So like a lot of it is just things that have happened. And I feel like experiences you go through or whatever, you kind of like tunnel vision, your kind of final product of what you're making or something. So it's kind of like this like ritualistic process of just like, that's how these things happen, I guess, for me at least. You know. So your project is called a horoscope. Does this have direct astrological connotations? Sort of, you know, there's like, you know, there's multiple reasonings to it. Reasonings why things happen. And I feel like that kind of influenced me to be like, oh yeah, that's kind of like horoscopes, how they work out in that way. And being Cuban, of course, right? Yeah. Mysticism and astrology and things like that are almost like totally. part of one's native habitat of how they just you know exist how has your cuban heritage influenced what you do i mean i grew up kind of like you know va like adjacently catholic but i had a cousin a cousin yeah a cousin who you know was really into santeria and like didn't drink for the year wore all white you know had the cabbage patch kid doll that like represented him and would put the rum and the quarters in front of it and like you know, like I remember like being really young and like knocking it over and he had to like, oh, I have to like pass an egg to like get all the evil energies out and all the, you know, like these type of things. Like also when you're young, you're and like I wasn't interested in that stuff when I was like seven. You kind of just find that as like this funny, jokey, stupid thing and kind of embarrassing sort of too. But as I got older, you know, you kind of like fall in, you, you kind of start seeing these patterns and like you're like, oh, yeah, that's like why he did that because like. He believed, it all makes made more sense to me as I got a little older and I like about it, you know. And those influences around you from such a young age, they can't help but pattern the way you think and the way you interpret, you for, know, for sure. Spirituality and presences and everything else. Yeah. I mean, you know, the first like Kenneth Anger film I saw, it was like, oh, like made me think of like, oh, it's like some Santeria shit or like, yeah. you know, so like you just don't know these things like, you know, and yeah. And then you find out it's all like kind of connected in this way. So. Yeah, I mean, that's the Cuban context. Like for me too, I had a, a great aunt and we're still very close actually. And she had this massive walk-in closet in Coral Gables, but then within the walk-in closet, there was a separate walk-in closet. And I remember I was about five years old and I walked in there one day, you know, to the forbidden second closet and I opened the door and there's this massive altar and a Shrine, chalice yeah. and a big sword hanging and just the walls are plastered with like framed pictures of like saints and deities and like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like saints with like bleeding gashes and wounds. Super brutal, and I was yeah. like, I, I terrified. Like my first instinct as a little boy was just to be like, <gasps> and like I struck cold and I ran out of the room and I was like, <gasps> Yeah. And I was so scared of my aunts were like, oh, shit, he went in the room. He went in the room, right. You know, and then, but it always, you know, fascinated me. And then my other great, great aunt also, she had all these altars and I was able to just go pyromaniac in there and play yeah. with stuff. I was like, just candles everywhere. Yeah, when I grow up, my life is totally going to be this, you know. Yeah. It's also funny because I was super, you know, like I was really into metal, like as a kid. Also, like, it's just like, you know, Florida stuff. But... All of that kind of like you heard like Danzig talking about, you know, like pagan, you know, Samhain or not saying Samhain or whatever. And yeah. all these like things that like I started to see the like correlation of my interests. You know, I got into coil, not trying to find like a crazy like 
out there esoteric thing just kind of like oh this sounds really cool and like dark you know and then you go down the hole and learn a little more and then you're like holy shit you know oh yeah i mean when i first discovered coil i was like this is gonna be the rest of my life yeah <laughs> it's definitely an important yeah don't for everybody and you have a project coming up with drew mcdowell right it yeah was, that's another tape we're doing i'm doing uh we recorded it a few years ago and we just kind of you know he got super busy touring i kind of same kind of thing and then i think during quarantine we kind of like got together and it was like a fun project to kind of like revisit and work on so when are you guys going to put that out uh soon uh, i think probably by the summer i don't know when but this label monorail of turf spessing is putting it out it's like a west coast noise kind of label nice yeah what's it called tongue is no substitute is the name of it right now it's like kind of like a weird uh it's like a weird kind of dark energy and i think i was really into i was doing these ritual performances at the time where i was kind of doing like you know these like like trying to get someone back spell and like also you know i was trying to I was doing the egg, kind of like washing myself with the egg and then cracking it to like get rid of the energy. Um, and I was doing all these things, but like me not knowing how to do any of that stuff, I kind of like Bolliskin house style, like open this door and never closed it. So it kind of brought a lot of like shit into my life that really like stuck around and fucked me up. So I kind of stopped doing those type of sets. Yeah, I mean, it's cool that it was part of the process for sure. Yeah. And there's procedures, you know, that you can do to like protect yeah. yourself. And, you know, you want to be sure that things yeah. are respectfully kind of like banished in their time. For sure. A crossroads is a great idea if you leave them at a crossroads or if you live uh, near, say, a river that like flows north or water that flows north. They say that's a really good way to. Huh. Uh, there's a crossroads by my place. I just like. I mean, that's the funny thing is I feel like a lot of that you kind of. Uh, like, you know, we all exist in these kind of like abstract thinking and then like you go into normal reality. So it kind of always, I always kind of like, there's still like a thing to it where like, yeah, like it's like, it's kind of the thing of the Santeria thing that we were talking about earlier where it's like, it's easy. You could still laugh at the like, you know, dude who thinks the Cabbage Patch doll represents himself or whatever. But also there is a, a, an energy in there and that's like legit. I felt like I really did do these things and I just didn't know. And I was like, I'm messing with a, a sort of frequency that like I'm not experienced in, you know, I'm like driving the car. I don't know how to drive, you know, Yeah. to make to get something I wanted or wanted to express or wanted to do so. Well, also, it was a really dark time in your life, too. Right? Sort of. Yeah. 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 It was almost like an antidote to these things. For sure. So and yeah, it was it was my it was all i could do and all i could think about so like it felt like the right thing to do yeah i mean despite the results that you got i think it's badass and i feel like you know yeah. it probably who knows like you know who knows where you'd be if you didn't do that exactly stuff. well it's all part of the ride you know the story is the whole thing you know yeah for sure so, yeah like that's how horoscope to me started as this idea of kind of like i'm making this happen and like doing these rituals and now I don't know. Now it's kind of like a thing. It's just become part of my life where I'm like, I'm, I'm obsessive with ideas that I have. And I kind of like, you know, I work all the time. I come home. I like focus all my energy on like working on stuff at home. It like relaxes me. It's like my thing. And then, you know, it, that's a lot more different than like, I need to make these things happen and I'll do anything to make it happen. You know, I was like cutting myself, like putting, I have like all these cigarette burns. I was putting cigarettes out on myself, all this stuff. Like, just horrible shit but like you know you'd go to work and people would be like oh shit like are you okay like yeah no i don't know some well yeah. listen i can't wait to hear all this output that you've yep. got coming out the record with drew and the rest of the you know purgings that you're doing when can yep. we expect those yeah i don't know through the year i guess would be my best answer amazing yeah well i'm super stoked i love your work Dude, thanks man. and it was so great having you here with us uh please stick around and we're gonna have mitch horowitz up next to walk us through the hermetic tradition So we're here with esteemed and highly accomplished scholar mitch horowitz to discuss the rather vast topic of hermeticism today we do want to discuss uh, the long trajectory of Hermeticism from its origins in Alexandria to its many permutations to the present. But 
what are some essential philosophical or spiritual tenets that you say best espouse the contents of the hermetic material? Well, probably the central idea of hermeticism is that the individual is a reflection of, an emanation of, the source of creation, which in hermeticism is seen as a higher mind, or what the Greeks called nous, and that you and I and everyone watching is in our own concentric sphere of existence a reflection of that higher mind. And like that higher mind, we too are capable of causative thought. Our thoughts are also creative in more than just a, a cognitive or motor function fashion. I would say that's probably Hermeticism's central view of the individual. What are kind of the, the, the steps or uh, the orders through which the individual consciousness must um, ascend to uh, attain this kind of uh, gnosis? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Within the hermetic cosmological view, reality consists of concentric circles of creation, each one its own cosmic framework. And we humans exist within a, a given circle of creation. There are beings, presumably, that are far advanced from us. Someone was just asking me the other night whether, based on that presumption, you'd have to also conclude there are beings that might be in concentric circles that are further than we are from the center of creation, which is very likely true as well within the Hermetic framework. And we are bound by the laws of the cosmic framework that we live within. Obviously, these bodies decay, decline, we face mortality, and so on and so forth. But we are able to participate in creation with minds that function within our framework, like the great mind, the infinite mind, the highest mind, noose, and through stages of realization, and also through stages of eternal recurrence, humanity is in a state of becoming. It's in a state of passing through concentric circles that get closer and closer to the center of creation. So this cosmology illustrates that there are different uh, uh, echelons of beings occupying these different realms. Does the hermetic material describe these at all? What we possess here in the 21st century, what our ancestors possessed in the Renaissance era, really just consists of fragments, very likely, of all the ideas and possibilities and conceptions that were written down. So it's not possible for any of us to say definitively this was the point of view. And of course, the point of view was dispersed across different ages, different individuals, different geographies. So there's no one central doctrine or point of view. But I would have to say that most of that material is tantalizingly silent when it comes to describing the nature of beings that we presume are in these other concentric circles. And we live in such an interesting age at this moment you know, here, our generation maybe is the first for which the UFO thesis, for example, is not speculative, is not theoretical in the sense that is it real, is it not real? You know, we know there's engineered phenomena that's showing up on Navy cockpit videos and so on and so forth. And it begs a tantalizing question now that, you know, we have so much empirical evidence that there are things going on outside of the immediate world that we know and that we're accustomed to, it, it almost begs the question of whether we're capturing interdimensional glimpses, perhaps, of entities, beings that exist in these other concentric circles. You know, that's just speculation on my part, but how can we not speculate, given where we are in the 21st century, given what we know in terms of um, string theory and interdimensional studies and uh, really good, solid laboratory-based psychical research, and now the mainstreaming of the UFO, UFO thesis, we're getting confirmations all the time that there is an extra physical quality to our existence. Our existence is not just cognition and motor functions. I think ours is probably the very last generation for which the philosophy of materialism is really going to be considered a, a serious school of thought, materialism being the philosophical belief that matter creates itself and that there's nothing present beyond chemical processes and you know bubbles basically in a glass of carbonated water. And when the carbonated water is gone, the bubbles are gone. You know, this idea that material just depends wholly upon 
itself. Whereas we're getting glimpses that there's a reality that's very possibly interdimensional, that's certainly extra physical. And so it begs one to ask, are we perhaps capturing glimpses of beings from these other concentric circles? Huh. Because here I am thinking, you know, sort of maybe middle platonic ideas of being influenced maybe by Plato's Timaeus, right? Like the sort of, you know, okay, in this sphere exists the spirits of, of Mars, and this is where our wrath and our passion resides, yeah. right? And yeah. in this sphere uh, is Venus, and this is where our pleasures or our vanity or our, you know, attachment to love might reside or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I never before would kind of, you know, incorporate UFO phenomena into, you know, one of these, you know, <laughs> this worldview. It's a question that's been in my mind for the last couple of years because you know, it's funny um, about 10 years ago I was at a conference at the Esalen Institute of people who study esoterica who are invested in psychical research who are interested in all kinds of esoteric questions and one night the topic of UFOs came up and the, the director of the Esalen Institute Mike Murphy said I want to know what this stuff is. And somebody said, look, you know, the fact is we here in the United States in the 21st century, we do live in a very materialist culture and the American public en masse is not going to believe in the UFO phenomena unless stuff shows up on radar. It's just that simple. And now, in effect, stuff has shown up on radar. You know, the evidence that we have with the release and validation of these military videos and the DOD now officially publicly reopening its investigation into UFO phenomena. All of this is such, and not to mention the years of testimony and other evidence, I mean, I'm talking about just a, a glacial tip of, of, of the evidence that exists, but all of this leads to, to the question of whether our generation is on some sort of a, a precipice in which we're going to reconceptualize human nature, perhaps as much as Darwinism compelled Victorians to reassess human nature. And it, it's funny, it used to be that every Halloween, you know, I'd start getting calls from mainstream journalists asking, is there an occult revival going on? And I, I, I would sort of smile at the question because the occult is an evergreen on the Western right. scene. And, you know, every generation feels there's some sort of a revival going on or a crisis going on or the end of the world going on. You know, it's just kind of how we're, we're built to think. We think we're always poised on some precipice of something or other. And for the very, very first time in years, ever since I've been asked that question, I've started to respond in the affirmative because I think we are experiencing things and not just in UFO studies, but in serious psychical research in quantum theory, in string theory and neuroplasticity in the outer reaches of placebo studies. We're starting to encounter questions that that so exceed materialism and and and, and for which we just have so much evidence and for which we've had testimony for centuries. And now we have clinical data that um, the question of probing our extra physical lives is no longer just theoretical. You know, it's, it's going on all around us. You know, and I didn't expect this conversation to go this route Nor at I. all. Nor okay, I. at all. <laughs> but I have to say, I mean, the connection between UFO phenomena and hermeticism, in my personal experience, is actually insane. Because <laughs> when I I was, I think this was maybe 2004, 2005. You no, know, I shot a film. I shot a film, and I I really went somewhere with this ritual. So I'm laying in bed, looking out my window, you know, just like drifting off to sleep, and I see this pink sphere, okay, in the middle of the sky, and it goes like this. It goes, doo, 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 stops dead, and then it goes, and then it goes like this. And like a tear came out of my eye. Like, I just saw a fucking UFO, and yeah. there's no doubt about it in my mind. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, was it because I did this ritual that I was somehow opened up, you know? to this uh to this thing and and you know there's this guy he calls himself prophet yahweh mm. and he claims that he read the old testament in the original hebrew mm -hmm. and you know as we know hebrew kabbalah uh similar to the neoplatonic or hermetic uh, idea yes, yes. of seven uh interconnected spheres except in the the kabbalistic tree of life these spheres are, are sort of descending right mm -hmm. but it's a similar arrangement mm -hmm. and um 
and the Hebrew letters have magical uh, power and whatnot and invocational capacities. So this guy, he's like, okay, well, I read the Old Testament in uh, the original Hebrew, and now I can summon UFOs. <laughs> and it's, you can't deny, broad daylight. Yeah. These like orange spheres, similar to the one that I saw, and they're like approaching him and stuff. And the, the people on the news are like, this is crazy. I mean, it's interesting, you know, we, we all have our vocabulary. And, you know, we use the term UFO and it's, it's loaded with cultural baggage as is ESP or mediumship or any number of other terms you know, we might use. But it's just a word, you know, it's just a word. You know, he says UFO, I say UFO, but it could be that that's part of what the religious appeal looks like. You know, it could be that's that the religious appeal the does religious open appeal the individual, like. you know, maybe for a limited the period of time, does to the capacity the to see things more clearly. For a limited you know, period of time, William James made the, the observation in 1902 clearly. that you know, William the James mystic the sees things as though looking at them under a microscope, the he or she sees more and more of what's really going on. You know, I look at a drop of water with my naked eye and it's like, well, it's just going on. You know, I look at a drop of water but that same drop of water under a microscope, as James says, the mystic sees it. But that same drop of water under a microscope, as James says, the mystic sees it. Bacteria, particles, and all kinds of things going on and dividing and reproducing and so on and so forth. Bacteria, particles, and all kinds of things going on and dividing and reproducing. People have been asking the question for the past generation. You know that. With all People these decades of, the of classical experiments now in quantum theory, with all these and with all the ways that particles on the subatomic scale behave in a, what we would consider a surreal manner, on the subatomic scale why don't we see this a, stuff what we would going on in the macro manner. world? Why, why is all of this unknown to us in the macro world? Ordinary why sensory why experience. All of this and some quantum theorists have come up with theory of information leakage, which is exactly what James was saying, although they don't reference it back to James. Information leakage is just essentially the idea that when you measure things with finer and finer instruments, you see more and more of what's really going on. And when you pan the camera back, so to speak, and just rely on the five senses, which are really organs for measurement, you know, basically, sight, touch, sound, so on, um, you lose um, resolution. You, you lose a sense of fineness of observation, the course of the instruments that you rely upon. So it could be that the quantum theorist using extremely fine instruments, photometers and other things you know, in the lab, sees more and more of what's really going on. Or it could be that the mystic, apropos of what James was saying, sees more and more of what's really going on. This may be reality. Philip K. Dick has a way of describing yeah. it as sort of like a disruption in our in our uh, normal perception, where uh, you know high weirdness as a, yeah. uh, uh, is able to like make its way in, and we're able to see it, and that and that similar to a microscope, perhaps these procedures, as first laid out by the you know Greco-Egyptian Gnostics or, or uh, Hermeticists rather, uh, are kind of a pathway to these things. And you know, to to conjoin with that. Again, you know, we have these words we use. So we use a word like Bigfoot to describe, you know, some, some sort of primate being that we don't understand. You know, somebody else calls it Yeti, somebody else says Sasquatch, somebody else has another word altogether. You know, it's all just cultural. But we have testimony extending across time, across all different continents that, 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 that attest to the existence of some unclassifiable primate. You know, and some people say, well, look, you know, we have all these Bigfoot stories, but we have no DNA evidence. And DNA evidence is considered the, the holy grail of, of, of clinical evidence, you know, within our scientific framework. And maybe so-called Bigfoot stories, maybe, are themselves just some sort of a, a kind of rift in our dimensional understanding or a rift in our ordinary sensory experience. Maybe that's true of things that go bump in the night. You know, maybe all phenomena is eventually going to be understood as manifestations of these kind of momentary abilities that we seem to possess of surpassing ordinary sensory abilities. I mean, you know, J.B. Ryan called it extrasensory ability, ESP. So we do have such terms, you know, for this extra physical perception that that seems to um, come and go from our reality. You know, we certainly do have statistical data that demonstrates the anomalous transfer of information in laboratory settings, which we would call ESP or remote viewing or psychical experience. And, 
that alone, I mean, this data has been with us since the 1930s, and it's been juried, and it's been picked apart, and it's more legitimate than any data we use for most of our pharmaceuticals. If there are holes in that data, then there's holes in our statistical models, basically, in some way that we don't understand. And even in the original hermetic material, I mean, the divine pimander is one of, you know, the central texts of the, of the earliest hermetic tradition, yes. really. And it has to do with the apparition of a reptilian fiery serpent creature who comes in and and reveals all of this information to a right. narrator who, who calls himself hermes yes so once again the serpent sort of turns us on to what's really going on yeah, yeah. would you say that um <clears throat> animism is part of the uh sort of transfiguration of the materialist model yeah i i, I think i mean I think animism and I think actually all forms of ancient deity worship have something to teach us today. You know, it seems to me that our ancient ancestors from across every culture and every civilization separated by vast distances of time, of geography, of cultural reference points, they all had systems of deific uh, worship. They all had gods and entities with whom they sought relationships, who they often personified with names like Set or Minerva or Zeus or what have you, you know, many other names besides. And they, they personified energies that they detected within nature and then sought relationships, sometimes petitionary relationships with these energies. You know, if we accept that our ancient ancestors were geniuses, you know, when it came to astronomy and calendrics and timekeeping and agriculture and engineering, are we just prepared to completely wipe away their religious model as if that has nothing to offer contemporary men and women? And I think it's very legitimate for the contemporary seeker to ask him or herself the question of whether the ancients have something to teach us in terms of veneration of deity and and whether they were in fact very effective in personifying or deifying energies and seeking relations with these energies and going back to hermeticism if there are other beings other intelligences that exist within these concentric spheres maybe maybe deity worship is a way of finding relationships with those other Entity. So I, I take all that very seriously as an area for, for the search. Yeah, most certainly in hermetic magic it is. Yeah. yeah. And even these, uh, you know, these lower spheres that you were asked about earlier, uh, quote unquote lower, right? If we can put them on a hierarchy. I feel like a lot of magicians today are starting to question if that kind of... Uh, you know, tier structured right. hierarchy is actually accurate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how a demon that is a, a thonic in some way should should be looked at as lower or or, or right. inferior. Like, what if that's a what if that's a some patriarchal prejudice, right? That right. needs to be reexamined. Right, right. Because Hermetica it almost immediately shed its original meaning of, of its Alexandrian origins. Yes. It's, it's almost yes. like an egregore that kept on building yes. on itself even after. Uh, Bruno and, and everybody, when it was rejected, it was yeah. persistent through the Enlightenment, through uh, the Rosicrucian mm -hmm. um, manifestos and the Rosicrucian sentiment that was really quite culturally impactful. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the books of Francis Yates are a testament to that. Tremendously so. Yeah. And then the century after, we had the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, yeah. which, you know, to a large extent, refashion magic in, a, in the cohesive manner in which we currently know it along the way hermeticism has absorbed right like neoplatonic influences and even you know hebrew influences yes. and arabic influences and yet we're still in this constant backward glance so much has been destroyed you know i mean the hermetica you know these manuscripts that were written down in greek and that began to reemerge in the renaissance very frequently when we say Hermetica, we mean the, the Corpus Hermeticum, which is a collection of about 17 manuscripts, 18 really, if you count a Latin manuscript called Asclepius, that were written down and, and translated largely in the Renaissance age. But 
there are so many other hermetic works. There's so-called technical hermetica, which is more often spells and alchemy and astrological works. And then there is the great hermetic work, the Emerald Tablet, which you were referencing in your introduction, from which we uh, derive the phrase, as above, so below. It wasn't until the early 1920s that scholars began to recognize the Emerald Tablet as an authentic piece of Hermetica, as an ancient Hermetic work. It was thought to have been a work that was written down in Latin in the medieval period, but in the early 1920s, a much earlier Arabic version was found of the so-called Emerald Tablet, which went to like maybe the 800s, 900s, very late antiquity. And so when this Arabic version of the Emerald Tablet was discovered, it was like a light went on. It wasn't that long ago either, because suddenly we could understand that this phrase, as above, so below, was not a piece of pseudo-hermetica that was fashioned in the medieval period, but, but also went back to the original um, era of the, of the hermetic literature. So we're learning more and more about the authentic antiquity of this hermetic literature, and we're learning more and more about its authentic correspondences to ancient Egyptian th thought. So it's exciting, you know, it's exciting. I mean, we have very likely a, a retention of a certain ancient Egyptian esoteric thought within the Hermetic manuscripts, and that's incredibly valuable. Another reference to Philip K. Dick in that book, I think it's Vallis, he talks about how the discovery of the uh, Nag Hammadi literature in the, I think, 1940s, although it didn't get published until the 1970s, right. it's like it woke some kind of sleeping giant that right. like reintegrated itself into humanity as this kind of like enlightening force. Right. And I can't help but think about that now, right? Like with Project Hindsight and yeah, yeah. all of these, you know, yeah. like, um, Alan White, Robert Hand, Robert Schmidt, Demetra George, taking all this ancient um, Alexandrian astrological material and astrologers are realizing like, oh, wow, you know, what a sophisticated and thorough science astrology really was in late yes. antiquity. And contemporary astrologers like myself are able to use it in very effective uh, and powerful ways. And it's like, it feels really magical. And it feels like being on a precipice. A precipice. and and. You alluded to something so important that I want to underscore. The Nagamati literature was discovered around the 1940s, wasn't published and available, certainly in English, until the 1970s. And there's very often a lag in how this material reaches the public. You know, reading the Hermetic literature has been hugely helpful to me as somebody who has a very deep commitment to New Thought. New Thought basically is the perspective that thoughts are causative. It's a modern philosophy that grew out of the wave of transcendentalism in New England in the mid-19th century. It found expression in movements that sprung up in the wake of transcendentalism, uh, prayer healing, um, mesmerism movement that predated transcendentalism, but that Americans grew very fond of experimenting with in the early to mid-19th century. And so this group of far-flung spiritual experimenters um, largely in America, got very interested in the question of whether thought has causative properties and thought can affect the body, thought can affect circumstance, thought is the lever of, of, of experience, basically, in a very literal, concrete way. The hermetic perspective is, yes, your thoughts are causative. Yes, as above, so below, as you are eminent from this higher mind or noose, so is your mind capable of causation or creation. But, but, we may be at a fairly disadvantageous sphere within the circle of creation, and we simply are subject to the laws of this sphere. I was reading, you know, your book when, when it first came out, and I was like, a new thought book. I know all about new thought. <laughs> but then I, I, I picked it up, and I was like, oh my God, if I know all about new thought, why haven't I been you know, activating these things. Why haven't I been using them? And so I followed the instructions in your book <laughs> and, you know, automatically the the degree of agency, you know, and I'm a practicing magician as it is, but um, it's, it's, you know, that's what people like you, I think, are, are here for, to remind us that, like, we have these potentialities. I want more than anything for the individual to feel that he or she is not without devices is not without possibility, that there are untapped sources of 
of power and possibility even when circumstances are profoundly difficult. And, and circumstances are profoundly difficult. I mean, there are horrible disparities in our world economically and geographically that are absolutely concretely real and, and require contending with on the terms of our world. And I also want them to realize that they have agencies that are untapped. I mean, we, we need all these things. But I, I want, above all, for people to feel that they're never without devices. They're never without possibilities. For sure. Yeah, especially in times like these where one can so easily feel subject to insurmountable exterior obstacles that are imposed upon them. Yeah. You know, uh, magic has always, I think, historically uh, been a key. Our mystical philosophies need to very deeply uh, encompass and come to grips with the nature of suffering in as much as they also need to leave room for the miraculous and the extraordinary, which is as much a part of life as anguish is. Exactly. And that's very important. Materialism as a philosophy is, is probably not going to reform itself. You know, it's probably going to become uh, a thought school that's a memory, you know, within a generation or so. But the materialist who insists that matter creates itself and that's the only game in town, end of story, you know, that philosophy is insufficient to cover experience in as much as the philosophy of there being one mental supermind is insufficient to cover to, to cover experience. You know, this is where we need to be searching. This is where we need to be searching because an experience of the miraculous can be very, very real and can, I think, connect to human agency. I feel that very, very strongly. And at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's repeatable. But because it's not repeatable doesn't mean that it's not real. It occurred. It occurred. And it may have great symmetry and we may be able to demonstrate that in certain ways and there are fields in which like psychical research we can demonstrate that but an event is not always repeatable which also doesn't compromise its its reality so we i believe we as seekers uh have to be more comprehensive and that 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 complexifies things but that's that's wonderful that's wonderful complexity shakes up orthodoxy so that that's all to the good. But there are so many questions still, and it is such a great time to be uh, alive and studying this work. And, you know, I'm certainly grateful for scholars like you and the work that you're doing at this critical and exciting time of, of investigation and translation and new information coming out. And your contributions are so valuable, and it's been so such a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. It, it, it's it's a pleasure likewise, and I I want to say a word of tribute to you because as an astrologer, you are studying ancient Hellenic texts that were written down in Latin and Greek that hold within them astrological philosophy that is coming to light to our generation for the first time in the modern age, and you've expanded your practice in your field of study as an astrologer to encompass this material from the ancient Hellenic age that we are gaining access to in English for the first time at this particular moment. And that's very exciting to me as well. And yeah. I really salute you for, for studying that. Thank you. Thank you very much. But for me, I mean, that's really what catalyzed it, right? Like as soon as astrology started getting hermetic, I was like, give me that. You know, <laughs> I mean, I used it, of course, right. like magically before. But right. as far as like natal astrology, it's these these new innovations that really brought it. You know, there is something about these teachings and there is something about these philosophies that the more they're uncovered and the more they come to light the more they as you say like inspire the soul you know and and if i may you know add one other um uh, observation you know it, it struck me that in our age you know for for a long time there have been naysayers about astrology who have said you know it's a bunch of nonsense there's no proof or whatever and my challenge to these people is not that they should go out and study astrology because that's not really fair i mean there's lots of i don't study you know, aerodynamics, but I trust the fact that there are certain engineers and pilots who have, so I get on an airplane and I, I rely on consensus opinion. And that's, that's proven to be a pretty good game. Right. But when it comes to astrology and other esoteric fields, the naysayers 
would ultimately say, I presume, well, I'm relying on consensus opinion too. What they don't realize is the experts upon whom they are relying also haven't studied astrology. And that's the difference. That's the difference. That's why consensus opinion is not a useful guide when approaching the esoteric arts, because the experts upon whom you may think you're relying, they also haven't studied it. Totally. As Austin Osman Spare said, knowledge is the excrement of experience. Yes. So especially when it comes to magic and occultism, it's something that one must experience yeah. <laughs> firsthand, right? Before one is able to attribute any kind of belief in it, right? Or any kind of, uh, you know, I always say, you know, uh, you don't need faith when you have experience. Yes. And that's a wonderful way of putting it. And I don't use the term faith much myself. I prefer the term persistence. You know, to me, mm. persistence is a kind of faith. And persistence is a faith with muscle where you're really searching. And that's what I encourage. Yeah. Well, it certainly is worth the journey. And, you know, thank you so much thank for you. everything that you've done towards it. And uh, may we continue to learn more and more. Amen. And Cheers. Uh, uh, uncover many, many lost manuscripts from ages past. So thank you all so much for watching. This has been April 2021, and we will see you next month for May. Thanks so much. See you next time.